planning on getting here. All right, good morning. This is the council's second work session in which we'll review the proposed general plan, HOCO by design. The proceeding this meeting this morning is a hybrid meeting, which is being held in person and via WebEx teleconference. It is also available to the public via video live stream online at the county council website. The council will conduct a series of work sessions and public hearings to review and obtain public comment on the proposed HOCO by design. Today's session covers the growth conservation chapter, the future land use map, technical appendix B character areas, and the fiscal impact analysis. The council will host public meetings, public meetings, I'm going to finish my coffee, um, in June, July, and September. A complete calendar of council meetings regarding the general plan can be found on the council's website at HowardCountyMD or HTPSS colon slash slash cc dot howardcountymd.gov slash home slash general dash plan. <laughs> um, or you can just Google HOCO by design. At this time, I'm going to do a roll call of the council members. Um, Dr. Jones. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Mr. Youngman. Present. Ms. Young. Here. And I believe Ms. Walsh will be joining us shortly. We'll now proceed with our agenda. We'll begin with growth and conservation, chapter two future land use map, plume, and character areas, Appendix B. Welcome, Director Gowan, and thank you again. I believe this is your last work session with us. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, enjoy. <laughs> thank <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> It'll be a quick meeting. <laughs> Finally. Well, good morning, uh, members of the council. Amy Gowan, um, Director for DPZ for another day. Um, as uh, Chair Rigby mentioned, we're here to discuss the Chapter 2, which is the Growth and Conservation Framework Chapter, which is accompanied by Technical Appendix B, the character areas. And so we're going to start out presenting those to you. Um, that presentation is m m around in maybe up to an hour. Um, and then we're going to move on to the fiscal analysis and present that afterwards. Um, and so we're going to start out with an overview of the flume and the character areas. Oh, there we go. Uh, so if you want to move to the, the, the flume. <laughs> so we showed you this at our last work session, the future land use map with the 18 character areas. As you recall, there is a strategy in HOCO by design to balance growth and conservation. Um, and that's depicted on the flume where most of the growth is focused into the um, redeveloped uh, activity centers. And then at the same time, the flume has the open space character areas to convey the intent that these areas remain within open space. Um, and I will note that the open space areas consist of state and county parkland, WSSC land, um, or WSSC open space land, and Columbia Association open space parcels. So all of that's in the open space character area. We also talked in the last work session about, uh, well, Councilmember Young um, specifically asked about uh, one of the differences between Plan Howard 2030 and TOCO by design. And one, one significant difference is the um, place type map with the four place types is being replaced by the future land use map with the 18 character areas. Um, and the rationale for that is that the flume, as you can see, provides greater predictability for the future as compared to the place type map, um, particularly because the flume's areas of transformation, transformation or where growth is targeted are more focused and specific as, compa as compared to the former, uh, the, the current general plan. Um, and I would also note that these areas um, that are the targeted activity centers comprise only one and a half percent of the county. So it's really as a small portion of the county. Um, and as opposed to, as you can see, the more expansive areas that were designated um, in Plan Howard 2030. So again, this, we believe it's a more predictable plan, allowing county agencies to effectively plan for infrastructure, better anticipating where the growth is going to be located. It's also important to note that the character areas in the flume don't prescribe zoning. So it's not a zoning map. It's really intended to inform the future zoning map, um, either by 
identifying the current character, which we want to preserve, or future intended character. And so this is just a little analogy, tulip analogy, that, we, that we've used. On the left, we look at um, the, the general plan level that we're operating in, the higher level, uh, where you can see like broad strokes and colors of the tulip, similar to how you would see the vision for the land use and the character areas in the flume. And then on the right, you see the, more f the finer details. Um, and that's the regulatory level, where you see you know, the, the petals and the veins of a single tulip, similar to the, um, the zoning regulations, where you get into setbacks and development standards and block sizes and all that good stuff. So the regulatory stage is where we more clearly uh, um, will align parcels with the character areas um, through, the, through the zoning <clears throat> process. And so now that I just did a little review of, you know, where we landed, we'll kind of kind of go back to how we got there, and I'm going to turn it over to Matt um, to talk about our organizational framework and some of the work we did along the way. All you, Matt. Great. Thank you, Amy. Yep. Great. Thank you, Amy. Um, yes, yeah, so I just wanted to provide a few brief comments in the opening um, to describe kind of the methods of the madness or how we organize things uh, within Chapter 2. And we start with what we call our PSET approach, which is areas to preserve, areas to strengthen, areas to enhance, and areas to transform. And as I will show you here later, you know, we have a lot of different uh, character areas and things going on, and there's a reason for that. But we also wanted to provide a very quick way and a quick understanding for everybody, whether it's the community, the development um, developers, elected officials, staff, of what are the intentions going on with the different character areas. And so that's where this concept comes from. It allows us to quickly organize different intentions that you may have for places within the county. It does create uh, better predictability. And probably most important, at least for me, is that it forms a little bit of a backstop. So if somebody asks for a change, you know, general plans are dynamic, opportunities change, markets change, technologies change. Um, but we think a framework like this allows a little bit of variability within the character areas, but still this overall predictability about what the expectations are for different places in the county. And as you can see, we have from the left to the right, you kind of move from less change to more change across those four categories to be expected and less intensity to more intensity. And if I just give you a couple of quick examples here, and we can obviously field as many questions as you want in details, but in terms of areas to preserve, there's, that's where the plan has formal statements, generally just to keep things as they are 99% of the time. It's really almost um, a protectionist category. Uh, and really to protect and preserve what is there today. As you then go into the strengthen category, um, these are where things are really in a good place in terms of character and use and market and things that are all playing together in a specific area of the county. But there might be very targeted improvements to make. It might be a streetscape project. It might be something else in what's called the public realm, uh, whether it's a small park space or something that could really just keep things going, keep the momentum going that's there. But generally speaking, the surrounding area is the most important thing. And if a specific lot or something is to contemplate a change, it's really about what would happen to the area as a whole in the strengthen category. Then when you get to the enhanced category, there is the openness for a little bit more change within those areas. Again, maybe because of technology or some market trends and changes that are going on. This is where we would say we have targeted infill development as a possibility within areas you, you would talk about in terms of enhancement. Um, specific improvements still should not upset the surrounding character. So it should be something that improves the momentum or the trajectory you're already on in terms of the targets you're setting for that area. An example for this might be in a residential neighborhood, the whole missing middle concept. And if you do infill housing for missing middle, uh, that would be an enhancement uh, type approach. Or if you have an aging retail center uh, and there's an idea about bringing in a new small shop or use, uh, the local example we have is we have a village green and then it just took off so much they decided to put the little uh, ice cream parlor on one end of the green to anchor it and provide some more activity. That would be considered an enhancement the way we, we wrote this plan that's presented to you today. And then you move to transform. Transform is where you are reimagining um, different parts or the whole of an activity center primarily. 
there would be significant changes possible in those areas when you're looking decades out. It could include changes in land use, so the mix of land uses, densities, the way lots and blocks are structured or created. Uh, therefore, these areas require the most deliberate planning. So things like the gateway master plan that were brought up before uh, some of the other um, uh, TOD type discussions that occur, uh, there's more deliberate planning that occurs in the areas to transform. Um, and again, we communicate that change uh, with this approach so that, you know, and everybody kind of understands um, when you're in 1 of these categories, what to expect as you go into more detail in the plan. If you go to the next slide, what you'll see is then applying. That framework that you see on the top of the slide uh, with much more granularity in what we call our character areas. And I've described this in other discussions I've had is think of these as sort of the ingredients and then think of the future land use map as the recipe. And there may be as time goes on a desire by 1 or more parties to change the recipe a little bit. But these are the ingredients that would be available and contemplated as you go through that process or if you go through that process. So again, setting the mindset and the tone across the top with areas to preserve, strengthen, enhance, and transform. We then categorize the different character areas, and there are 18 of them, under that category to, again, communicate not just what and how, but sort of right out of the gate, what is the expectation for those places? And you can see we have specific categories, and some may wonder or you may ask, why 18? That sounds like a lot uh, of categories. Um, there's really two things driving that. One is in Howard County, especially, there is a tremendous number of experiences if you go from west to east that we need to capture within a county. It's a wonderful opportunity and an asset, but it does lead to more character areas so that we don't generalize things that are really special. The other uh, thing that we do here is we are describing things that are on the ground today uh, in the in the character that they are in today. But as we've talked about in the meeting previous, you only have 2% of your land that's undeveloped and unprotected. And because of that, some of the uh, competition for space is maybe leading to some additional ideas and thinking under that predictability campaign. And so in order to do that, some of these are more aspirational in terms of what they're trying to achieve. And so communities we work in who are really at that kind of point of having a rural suburban and an urban context all playing at the same time require more categories. So that's sort of how we how we got to the number of ingredients that we have. And then finally, just to expand and again, we can talk more during the question and answer period. Uh, but for each 1 of these character areas, we've also gone into much more detail than your previous plan had on what to expect with those. And it was built off the notion long ago that if you lead with character, other things should fall in place. So instead of starting with what the land use should be or what an open space requirement should be or a transportation discussion, we started with character first for all of these. And because of that, uh, you see that we had to provide more information and more expectations for that. And so you actually see the big topics circled here. So for each character area, we not only talk about maybe what what um, target uses and things might be there, but also what would the street and block pattern look like? What type of open space elements or natural preservation are we looking for specific to that character area? How are buildings placed and how large are lots? Um, how, how big are buildings? Are they pushed up to the street? Or are they set back from the street? And what types of modes of transportation are being uh, advocated or promoted for within the different character uh, type typology, the different categories? And what this also does is it really sets up well for when you go into your comprehensive rezoning, because we've set some additional expectations that you don't have to guess about during the rezoning process. We've kind of planted some of those seeds in the general plan uh, that then zoning will take on and provide more detail around kind of the meat on the bone. So again, just a quick introduction to our framework and our character areas, and then staff is now going to kind of break this down and show you uh, more detail on where they apply. Thank you so much, Matt. Uh, good morning. I'm Kate Bollinger with the Department of Planning and Zoning. And um, what I'm going to do is walk through all of the 18 character areas. Um, Matt mentioned that technical appendix B, the character areas appendix, it has um, the recipe for each of these. It has a lot of details. But I'm just going to hit the high points, and I'm going to present them in groups 
starting uh, with our areas to preserve. So areas to preserve uh, safeguard our rural, historic, and environmentally sensitive lands, like those in our historic areas in the rural west, in our parks, and open space. And so uh, areas within uh, this part of the PSET framework include special use, open space, rural conservation, rural living, and historic communities. And so you can see these uh, isolated on this map uh, where we have taken away the other character areas and just uh, shown these five. So the special use areas are shown in light gray and these are the areas that are uh, landfills, quarries, or other unique special uses, you know, like Alpha Ridge Landfill. Then we have open space areas in green. Um, Amy mentioned these earlier, uh, that they include County Columbia Association, Parks and Open Space, um, other preserved lands. Then we have the rural conservation areas. These are in light green. And this matches up with the rural conservation zoning in the rural west. And so it includes uh, both farms and large lot homes. Then we have rural living. This is the tan color, and it corresponds with the rural residential zoning in the rural west. Uh, so it also includes farms, large lots, but also cluster subdivisions. And then finally, we have our historic communities. These are in dark blue. So you can see the historic Ellicott City, Lawyers Hill, Savage Mill, and Elkridge Main Street. So then we'll move on to the next category. Um, and instead of dividing out the strengthen versus the enhanced category, we're gonna group residential and then non-residential will be next. So you can see in uh, the typology here that all of these character areas span more than one PSET category. Um, and this is because there are different locations within each of these character areas uh, that might have different opportunities to either strengthen or enhance, going back to that um, level of change that Matt explained. And so uh, the historic communities character area, it falls both within areas to preserve and areas to strengthen. And then the remaining four character areas go across strengthen and enhance. And these are the rural crossroads, mixed use neighborhood, multifamily neighborhood, and single family neighborhood. So then on the map, uh, you can see that single family neighborhood, this is the yellow, um, it is majority of uh, the area of the county to the east, and it includes both single-family detached or attached homes throughout the county. Multifamily neighborhoods is the brown color, and uh, that generally includes complexes or communities of apartments, townhomes, stacked townhomes, triplexes, quadplexes, or cottage dwellings. Then we have mixed use neighborhoods. Uh, this is light pink. These are master plan communities like Maple Lawn and Turf Valley. And so these are areas with a mix of uses, including a small neighborhood activity center uh, surrounded by a variety of home types. And so we wanted to point out here that all of the neighborhood character areas talk about opportunities for missing middle housing uh, in select instances. And they emphasize how new housing units should be compatible and integrate with surrounding neighborhoods uh, in terms of things like site orientation, bulk, massing, and proportion. And we will get more into uh, this, what's called context-sensitive design when we get to our quality by design work session in June. Or is it July? It might be July. Um, all right. So then we also have uh, rural crossroads, historic communities. They include both residential and non-residential uses, and they fall within multiple categories of the organizational framework. 
So we already pointed out where the historic communities are. Um, rural crossroads are small nodes of mixed use areas focusing on commercial activity in the rural west. They span the strengthen and enhance categories. And the, uh, the character area description for rural crossroads also notes the potential for limited new residential or offices above storefronts, including missing middle. Um, and the description emphasizes the terms small and small scale to, um, to emphasize an overall feel of a rural main street. And these areas are shown in uh, the lighter blue and include Highland, Lisbon and the Glen Elg Crossroad areas. So then we move on to our non-residential areas to strengthen uh, and enhance. And um, so we already covered historic communities, we already covered rural crossroads, and then we have industrial, campus, and suburban commercial. These are all under the enhance category. So our industrial areas are shown in gray on the map. They include manufacturing, flex, warehouse, distribution uses throughout the county, uh, but you can see that they are really focused primarily along Route 1. And then campus areas are shown in the teal green on the map. These are large institutions like Howard County General Hospital, Howard Community College, and uh, the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. And so this campus character area was created uh, based on requests from these large institutions for more flexibility uh, in order to meet their unique needs. And then lastly, we have suburban commercial. These are the gold areas on the map. These are retail and office centers throughout the county. So shopping centers, office complexes, and other retail destinations. All right, and then the last category, the areas to transform. These are primarily our activity centers. And then there are also multifamily neighborhoods uh, in recognition that there may be opportunities for some to transform as they age and as opportunities uh, for redevelopment come about. So this is uh, a map of our activity centers um, that uh, breaks them out with a, a different color scheme and then zooms in different areas of the county uh, in order to help you see these. And we'll point out here that um, some of these activity centers have already been redeveloped or are in the process of doing so, like Wild Lake and downtown Columbia. And then there are other areas that have been planned to redevelop since the last general plan, since Plan Howard 2030, uh, like the village centers. And we show these as dots as compared to the stars in that plan. And then we also have a few areas that were newly identified through our process um, with our planning advisory committee, uh, the two shopping centers that are identified along the Route 100 corridor. So I'm gonna now walk through each of the different activity center types. All right, so we mentioned uh, downtown Columbia and how HOCO by design um, incorporates the downtown Columbia plan by reference. So we are continuing the recommendations of the 2010 downtown Columbia plan, um, as well as you know, we acknowledge that neighborhood design guidelines have been created for downtown. And so HOCO by design is not changing the direction of any of that. And then there's a gateway. So uh, this consists of Columbia Gateway Business Park and HOCO by design identifies this as a regional activity center. Um, so this is viewed as potential to be a large regional growth center in the future alongside downtown Columbia. And uh, what we do in HOCO by design is we offer general guidance for how Gateway can become an iconic model for sustainable, innovative development and infrastructure 
and we talk about a future master plan uh, that would specify the uses, form, building scale, and design features or controls for the area. And there's more about Gateway in the focus areas appendix, which we'll talk about in July. All right, so then we get to our transit activity centers. Uh, these are along Route 1, around the three mark stations uh, in Laurel, in Annapolis Junction, and Dorsey. And these are areas offering opportunities for compact, mixed-use development that maximizes residential, commercial, and open spaces within walking distance of public transit. And so given their proximity to transit, the design of transit activity centers um, is meant to maximize transit ridership. So then we have the village activity centers. And um, these offer opportunity to serve the needs of residents within and surrounding villages in Columbia. Village activity centers should maximize connections to the Columbia Open Space Network, including safe and convenient pedestrian and bicycle access from nearby neighborhoods. Um, we mentioned the, um, the stars in Plan Howard and then the circles here being consistent uh, in location. And then we'll talk more about uh, Columbia, as I mentioned, when we get to the uh, quality by design chapter and the focus areas appendix at that work session in July. Okay, then we have the industrial mixed use activity center. So these are places where people live, work, create, build, store, and distribute goods and services throughout the county and the region. So this is a character area that um, incorporates the idea of the maker economy and is also about urban design and fostering mixed use activity um, and providing opportunities for people to live and work uh, with restaurants, cafes, small-scale manufacturing, and commercial uses. So um, this is something that applies to activity centers in Route 1, and also uh, we extended to part of the southern portion of the Snowden-Dobbin corridor near Guilford Road. And then this is the last of our activity centers, the mixed-use activity center category. So. Uh, these are centers offering opportunity to serve broader economic, entertainment, and housing needs in the community through uh, walkable environments with a mix of uses and housing types. And uh, we pointed out uh, before that uh, HOCO by Design continues Plan Howard 2030's activity centers uh, as far as Route 40 and also Route 1. I'll just go back so you can see the blue there along the Route 1 corridor. And then how our planning advisory committee members uh, provided additional suggestions for these activity centers along Route 100. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Sarah Latimer, to talk about the process that we went through to develop and refine the future land use map, as well as some of the key changes that we made along the way based on uh, feedback from the community. Thanks, Kate. Good morning, everyone. I am Sarah Latimer from the Department of Planning and Zoning. So with that, we will dive right into the weeds of the flume. So scenario planning helps us gauge potential futures, set aspirations for the character of different areas, and measure potential impacts and infrastructure demands of different futures throughout the county. We mentioned at the first work session how we held a growth cho choices workshop series. This allowed the community to look at alternative futures for the county from maintaining the status quo for development to establishing activity centers of various sizes and multiple locations. In the workshop series, the community responded to four different growth scenarios and eight decision points. Oh, move a little closer. Thank you. Is that better? There we go. <laughs> Thank you. All right. The four scenarios included scenario A, growth undercurrent zoning. Scenario B, plan Howard 2030 with defined growth areas. Scenario C, 
growth centers to encourage transit potential, and scenario D, countywide growth to meet projected demand. We used community viz software to model potential future growth and conservation patterns and to measure potential impacts of each scenario. Community viz is a holistic land use model that assesses current and potential future development and conservation in context with existing conditions and potential impacts. Not only was the software used for scenarios, it was also used to evaluate opportunities and constraints related to expanding the planned service area, which Mary will cover later in the presentation. Community Viz was also used to measure potential impacts and opportunities to preserve environmental features like the green infrastructure network. After we held the Growth Choices Workshop Series in March of 2021, we went through an iterative process with our planning advisory committee to develop what we called a hybrid scenario, which is shown as the hybrid elephant with the butterfly wings on the slide. That is, elements of each of the four scenarios were selected rather than just picking one of the four scenarios. For example, our hybrid scenario builds on the Plan Howard 2030 scenario, so scenario B, along with elements of scenario C, which identified growth centers to encourage transit potential. The final preferred hybrid scenario is the HOCO by Design Future Land Use Map, or FLUME. Again, a key feature of the hybrid scenario is strategic redevelopment within focused areas of the county as activity centers. We use community viz to essentially ground truth the flu. Basically, we use the software to ensure that the hybrid scenario could work with the land supply and to look at impacts. We also conducted a fiscal impact analysis, which Jeff Brown will be sharing more about that in a later work session, or in, later in the work session, sorry. The Flume has been an evolving document since we first released a version to the public back in August of 2021 during the draft plan workshop series. At several points in the planning process, we have taken feedback from our planning advisory committee, technical advisory group, and the general public in order to refine the Flume multiple times. We released a subsequent version in April of 2022 to the PAC and conducted a further refinement in December when we released the public draft. The latest version is dated March of 2023 and is shown on the slide. This is the version we presented to the planning board. Let's start in. So we wanted to call your attention to a few of the changes that were made to the flume based on the feedback we received from the community and from the PAC, starting in Elk Ridge, which came up during our first work session. Initially, we did not include historic Elk Ridge, including Elk Ridge Main Street, in the historic communities character area, but based on our PAC's recommendation, we added it to historic communities. Also in Elk Ridge, we made some changes to the activity center there. One thing we heard a lot about was the need to support the continuation of industrial businesses along Route 1. There was feedback that we should reconsider the assignment of character areas within our Route 1 activity centers and ensure industrial uses may continue. We also heard that figuring out ways to direct trucks away from residential areas and activity centers will be important. So in response, we modified both the future land use map and our Route 1 plan maps. So the Route 1 plan maps are shown on the slide here. In Elk Ridge, to ensure light industrial uses are allowed to continue and in support of the plan's goal to retain existing industrial land, we reassigned areas surrounding Pine Avenue from mixed-use activity center to industrial mixed-use. In Dorsey, we removed areas surrounding Kit Kat Road from the activity center. This change maintains them as industrial uses and allows trucks to continue to access Dorsey Run Road south of the activity center. And industry also came up with regards to Columbia. We heard there's an opportunity to maintain industrial employment where it is currently allowed under FDP and is successful. So we reassigned the southern portion of the Snowden Dobbin Activity Center from mixed use to industrial mixed use to allow light industrial uses to continue in the area between Route 32, Gerwig Lane, and Snowden River Parkway. We also removed a southern portion of the Snowden Diamond Activity Center south of Gerwig Lane and reassigned the character area to industrial consistent with existing conditions. So now that we've reviewed a few of the key changes made to the flume based on feedback we've received, I'll pass it on to Mary, who will provide us with a review of our strategy for growth and conservation. Yes, thank you, Sarah, that was great. Uh, good morning, everyone. Mary Kendall, Deputy Director with the Department of Planning and Zoning. Um, so this is the concluding section of our um, presentation one for this work session. Uh, and this brings us to our strategy for growth and conservation. So this slide in front of you, we did present it at our first work session. And we talked about how the county has reached a critical inflection point where our land constraints could impact the ability to grow in the future. We pointed out that we only have about 2% of our land that remains undeveloped or unprotected much of which is spread throughout the county. 
Um, and many of these undeveloped or unprotected parcels have various challenges, such as having unus unusual shapes um, or environmental features that would constrain their development potential. So this means that we have limited greenfield locations to accommodate growth. So this plan really has an emphasis on redevelopment, which I know you're hearing uh, time and time again. Uh, so again, this brings us back to that strategy for growth and con conservation, which is um, an emphasis on strategic redevelopment of activity centers, as these are the places for the most transformative uh, opportunities for growth. Uh, in the first work session, we also talk about the benefits of redevelopment as a part of this strategy. Redevelopment um, also brings some environmental be benefits. It can be greener. Uh, it can improve stormwater conditions and create open space. It can offer community gathering spaces. Uh, through redevelopment, we're proposing we could meet our housing and commercial demand. Uh, also, we can redevelop by um, including transit infrastructure, such as sidewalks, bike paths, and connection to future transit services. Through redevelopment, we also have the opportunity to include an array of diverse housing types, affordable to all income levels and accessible to people with varying abilities and needs. And on the conservation side of our growth and conservation strategy, uh, this plan really does elevate ecological health uh, as a priority. And that's something we'll talk about in the future work session that focuses on ecological health. Uh, but within that particular chapter, we really do emphasize uh, the need to adapt to and mitigate climate change um, and preserve and conserve our natural resources. Uh, so now let's talk a little bit about um, our evaluation of expanding uh, the planned service area. Uh, Sarah mentioned that earlier. Uh, so this was contemplated uh, during our scenario planning process as many community members expressed a desire to expand the PSA. Uh, especially if there was an opportunity to create more um, affordable housing, more diverse housing stock out in the West. But we also heard a lot of concern about this. Uh, so we evaluated whether or not an expansion could be feasible. But we found that there were several challenges to being able to do that. Uh, so most of the land out west of the, west of the PSA is either already permanently preserved uh, or it's already been subdivided into individual lots under separate ownership. So what this map shows that's on the slide is that there's a limited number of undeveloped parcels that really have potential for any kind of development, uh, primarily based on parcel size. Those are identified in yellow on the map. Uh, and those parcels are scattered throughout the West. So trying to capture these undeveloped parcels within the PSA would require a large wholesale expansion. Uh, and that would be fairly cost prohibitive uh, due to the cost of extending water and sewer across preserved farmland, which you can see identified on the map. It would also put housing uh, pretty far away from existing infrastructure, such as public transit services, uh, and it would have an adverse impact on the rural character and agricultural uses in the West. Um, and the county, I'm sure everyone knows, has uh, quite a history of preserving land out in the West for the past 50 years. Uh, we've been investing in our ag land preservation program and intend to continue to do so in a, as outlined in the policies and the plan. So consistent with the previous general plan, uh, HOCO by design proposes to allow limited and predictable planned service area expansions, of course adjacent to the, the PSA, the current PSA, and that could be done via a general plan amendment. And it could be done for proposals such as an expansion for a public or institutional use, such as a religious facility or an academic institution. But what we've added to HOCO by design is that proposals for development opportunities that increase the supply of affordable housing, uh, especially housing that's affordable to low to moderate income households, uh, such as missing middle or older adult housing, that a PSA expansion could be considered for those justifications as well. And we felt that this approach could guarantee that expansions of the PSA would actually yield affordable units versus a wholesale expansion. <coughs> uh, so in HOCO by design, there are two minor PSA expansions. Uh, one is a minor expansion for the Board of Education property. That's on Route 108 for a future school site that's encircled in yellow. Um, and then the second one is for um, a property uh, that's looking to be included in the water service only area um, within the PSA. So that is encircled in red. You can see it's just right across um, the street from the existing water service only area in the PSA. Uh, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about 
um, our jobs and housing, housing projections in relation to demand. Um, so basically, when we were trying to determine what our growth projections would be in relation to demand, we compared uh, several figures. Um, so that first number, there's demand uh, from our market, market forecast that was done as a part of our um, physical assessments. Uh, we also looked at existing land supply capacity. Uh, that was also included in our land use assessment. Uh, and then we looked at future land capacity based on modeling in the flume. So let's start with jobs. Um, okay, so we found that basically there's a demand for about 59,000 jobs moving forward um, over the next 20 years. However, uh, the existing capacity based on current zoning is only about uh, 28,000, so we could accommodate about 28,000 jobs. So that's about half the projected demand. However, when we, uh, within our community VIS model, uh, we were able to determine that the future land use map that is in HOCO by design, that could accommodate up to 35,000 jobs, mostly because of these redevelopment opportunities within activity centers. So it's higher than the existing capacity, but not yet meeting that potential projected demand. Um, also do want to point out that the, uh, potential, the, the potential for 35,000 jobs, as was modeled in our current future land use map, uh, that does not include any job projections for Gateway, because uh, that will all be something that would be further explored and analyzed, determined through a master planning process. So then when we look at housing numbers, um, so currently, uh, again, based on uh, current zoning, according to our community VIS model, Currently, we have the capacity for 15,200 more homes. Uh, however, we have a demand for about uh, 31,000, and that doesn't accommodate, that doesn't count for the 20,000 uh, in pent-up demand that we currently have. So the future land use map um, is modeled at 27,000 new homes, so higher than existing capacity, but not yet reaching um, the demand. Uh, I do want to point out that, remember, so the current um, capacity is 15,200, future capacity 27,000. Uh, much of that additional capacity is modeled within those future activity centers. Um, also want to point Ms. out Ms. Kendall, that does that include gateway, the housing? No. Okay, so neither for jobs or housing is gateway included in that Correct. singular slide. Okay, thank you. But part of what this 27,000 um, potential new homes could have within this future land use map, uh, we did, which we'll talk about when we get to the managing growth chapter, there is a proposed affordable housing set aside. Um, so that has, so there could be uh, potential there as well. Uh, so to conclude, um, so you remember this vision, we shared this with you in the last work session. Um, and we feel that this future land use map does clearly depict a growth and conservation strategy that's in align with the general plan's vision. Our activity centers are intended to offer opportunities for sustainable redevelopment in targeted predictable locations where we can offer more affordable, attainable, and equitable housing options. And with the emphasis on redevelopment, it is the best opportunity to accommodate demand for jobs and housing, plan and budget for infrastructure with predictability and specificity, and maintain the character of existing neighborhoods as we went through, um, when we went through the PSET framework, preserve, strengthen, enhance, and transform. So that concludes presentation one. Uh, so now we'd like to uh, turn it back to the council chair for our discussion. Great, who would like to begin? I'm happy to begin. Yeah, mine, I'll jump in. All right, thank you, Dr. Jones. Um, we'll start with a question from you and then we can go to Ms. Young. Yes, um, I only have one question. I'll first say that it was an amazing presentation. Uh, thank you for all the thoughtfulness and all the charts and the numbers and the figures. Um, given that the general plan right now is set to be not have um, not meet the demand, what in your ex expertise, um, Director Gowan and staff, um, what happens to the pricing of housing? Like what happens to the local economy? What happens to Howard County as far as when people are trying to buy a new home, come here, purchase their first home? What happens when the demand is not met and we're not building as fast as or as much as we can? Okay, I'll start off and then staff feel free to jump in. I mean, I think we see, obviously we see that um, already happening now where 
we have the 20,000 um, in pent up demand and you just have housing prices escalating and obviously our um, demand is, is out is outperforming the supply and so you know I think we just continue to see the county become more and more unaffordable um, in addition to that we have more people commuting in to the county that can't afford to live here so that puts more traffic on the roads and more greenhouse gas emissions um, and then you know more demand on uh, the need for transit because uh, we have more people in their cars um, did anybody want to add anything to that Matt, did you did you want to add anything to that? The only small point I would make on that is, and Amy's answer was perfect, but um, because your land supply is running out, you're going to have a different clientele wanting to move in anyways because people who are looking for single-family homes on large lots just won't be able to find it. Um, so even if you do increase the number of housing units that can be built, it, it may still not meet some of the demand uh, or your historical demand of what the preferences have been within Howard County. I think the, the other thing I'll just mention because Jeff is going to get into it, but obviously there's going to be fiscal impacts to the county um, if we don't achieve uh, the levels of growth that we have been achieving, um, or at least a, at least a steady pace, right, um, which we have currently under our APFO, and Jeff is going to get into that in more detail with the fiscal analysis. Ms. Young? Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, one of the questions I have is under the undeveloped, unprotected land section on page 9, it states that the existing land is not developable, developable because of partial, parcel shape and size and environmentally sensitive features. And then it goes on to state that 2,024 units could be built on those steep slopes, wetlands, and other ecological treasures if regulations were changed. In Chapter 6, Dynamic Neighborhoods, it states that any new housing should be sensitive to our natural environment. So how do you propose to make protected lands both buildable and protected? These seem like they're two incompatible policy goals and that we'll have to pick one or the other. Can you respond to that? Sure, I can jump in. Um, so the development capacity estimated for undeveloped, unprotected land is including those environmental protections. So much of the land does uh, include things like steep slopes and floodplains, so that would not be developable but including the other portion that would be developable of that undeveloped, unprotected land, that would estimate about the 2,000 units. So there's no proposed change to um, the environmental protections there on that land, that the steep slopes and floodplain remains protected with that capacity of 2,000 units. So the 2,024 would not be creating ecological damage? That would be under current regulations, so that would be... Um, still protecting things like steep slopes, floodplain, stream buffers that would not be on those environmental resources. I guess my fear was when I read that is when it said under current regulations that it implied that there would be pressure on the council to change those regulations. So I'm wondering if that was the thought process. I think this, this section right here is just merely um, explaining what the kind of the, the current conditions are, the existing conditions, but it's not making any recommendations for maintaining that moving forward. So we're it, not... It's just saying that there's, there are um, these parcels that are environmentally constrained under current zoning could accommodate over, over 2,000 units today. And, and then there are new policy goals in the ecological health chapter that may speak to um, how we may want to address that from a regulatory perspective moving forward. So how would we, what are your recommendations then addressing that moving forward? Those, are, those policies are in the ecological health chapter. Um, so it does talk more specifically about how regulation changes may be explored with respect to, let's say, buffer regulations, um, whether they need to be enhanced, 
um, redevelopment credits for stormwater management, things of that nature. So there's a number of them, but they're in the ecological health chapter. And they could apply, you know, to these these parcels that, you know, have the um, environmental constraints on them. Okay, thank you. Unless there's more that you'd like to add. Unless Sarah has anything no, else. No, I think, I think you covered it well. Um, so I, I have a few more questions. Um, well, hold on. Let's have, let's keep rotating so everyone has an opportunity. Ms. Well, Walsh? I mean, I think going to Ms. Young's point, the premise of this plan that you have before us is that we will develop the remaining 2% of undeveloped land. Is that, I mean, what? Okay, because we're talking about identifying green fields, there's not that many more. I don't, I mean, hopefully these will be the pretty slides we see next time about ecological preservation, but I totally agree with Ms. Young. Yeah, that, it's nothing, I can't reconcile any of these chapters with each other and particularly as it goes to conservation, you know, you're calculating the number of units based on developing that undevelopable land up to whatever the stream buffer is or the steep slope is. Like, is there, is there, that's not the premise of this, that we're going to I develop to the maximum extent, the 2%? No, not, not at all. Mm -mm. The premise is really, as we explained, to target the growth in the redevelopment areas, thus taking pressure off of um, potential development of our environmentally constrained properties. So if there is demand, we want that demand to be in these targeted activity centers where we can anticipate the growth, we can plan for the infrastructure around that growth, and that we can take the pressure off of the areas that are you know, environmentally sensitive so that they are hopefully you know, not, not developed or to a lesser extent. Okay, but you have a target for Houses, do you have a target for green space? Well, I, I mean, why don't we, why aren't we valuing other concepts other than growth? This is clearly driven by growth. This is clearly driven by housing units. What value in this entire process are we placing on green space? Yeah, so I think that will all be covered when we get to the ecological health chapter, but there is recognition of the goal to preserve 40% of the land by 2040 and to evaluate whether or not we should or shouldn't have some of those preservation targets. So that's all definitely in the ecological health chapter. Okay, yeah. I will ask this question again then, but okay. I can't reconcile this at all. Okay. And I'm actually done trying. Like, I just can't. Yeah, well, and there, there are questions. some policies in ecological health, health that speak to um, additional avenues of conservation, um, such as exploring the Agricultural Preservation Fund to be used for environmental preservation and things of that nature, so expanding that program. Um, but, but again, yeah, that, that policy direction is, is within the ecological health chapter. Right, Mr. Youngman. Um, back to the, these demand numbers. Um, we have it broken down, housing, employment, and commercial. Um, so projected demand on employment, what's that based on? Is that a hope? Is that aspirational? Is that based on hard numbers that we know of? Yeah, I was going to see if Jeff could jump in on, do, on some do, of those demand numbers. You know what? Even though it was covered in this first section, do you? well, let's cover it now because there will be other questions when we get to fiscal. Yeah, so that was a market study by RCLCO. And if you look at that study, the 31,000 jobs – really is, in my view, looking at historical trends. So I have a slide that you'll see in the fiscal impact analysis that um, shows that we've had about 33,000 jobs per year over the last few decades. So the, they've determined that those trends um, are likely, are based in demand and will likely need to continue into the future. They do look at things at like, at, for example, job to housing ratio at the regional level and come up with, with um, some statistics related to that as well. Driven by the housing number or driven by the jobs number? I think both in combination, really. Okay. They kind of looked at what's, what a good balance is. So oftentimes when you <clears throat> look at that balance, um, it's really based on a regional balance that makes the most sense because we have a regional economy. So to have a jobs housing balance like within Howard County versus other counties, it's really looking at a regional county. So they, they took that into consideration, I think. And, but mostly it was based on the fact that we've been growing by 3,000 jobs per year, and that's um, reasonable 
that it would likely continue into the future. Um, and then is, is the housing demand a function of those 35,000, or sorry, 59,000 jobs? I think in their analysis, that's when they use the jobs housing balance to, to come up with the housing demand. They also looked at um, um, the types of housing at the different market levels that the housing exists, you know, current exists. And that's how they came up with the $21,000 pent up demand. So based on kind of the current income stratus in Howard County and the current housing that's available, they found that there's some pent up demand of about 20,000 units, mostly lower income housing for those. And then the future demand of housing does relate to uh, potential you know, job growth into the future. So, so of that 31,000 over 18 years, only 11 of that is what we need for these 59,000 jobs, and the other 20 is this supposed pent-up demand? Are you referring to the housing? The 20 the, am, am I not? Yeah, the, the, the projected demand in housing is 31,000 and uh -huh. jobs is 59. Right. So if in the 31, 20 is this no. assumed demand that we have no. now. No, the, yeah. it's actually 50,000. 50. So it's, it's 31,000 projected demand or 29,000 projected demand for housing and then an additional 20 or so thousand. Um, so according to RCLCO, their assessment is that over the next 20 years to meet demand, Howard County uh, would need to have 50,000 homes. And then one of the other things, and I think that, Amy, you said it when um, you answered this question. Um, so let's say of those 20,000 demand now, and they're working here, it sounds like. Are they working here, or they just want to live here? Like, where, what's, what makes up that 20,000? The pent-up demand? Yeah. Based on, on their assessment of the need, um, primarily for lower-income housing. So if you look at the income range of, of Howard County, they, they say that there's, based on the income in the, in the, of, of the current residents in Howard County, um, they've come up with this figure of 20,000 pent-up demand. So, so those people were already here? I, I think, thought that number was the, the 5,000 number. Many of them are working here and can't afford to live here. I think that was one of the yeah. underlying assumptions. Yeah. So we, so we're, we're, the economy's running right now with like 20,000 workers, or let's say 20,000 households worth of workers that we're saying need to be here, but they're not. Where, where are they? Are they driving in? Are they? Well, I think it's, I'd have to look. I don't, I don't know. I'd have to look at the details of that study again. We, we did that study a, uh, a year back or so, but we can probably. Yeah. I mean, I think that's just, that was their way of quantifying the, the, un, the under supply that we have right now. I mean, we know there's more demand than supply, and particularly in those lower price points. Mm -hmm. And that was their quantification of that un, under supply. I mean, the reason the why I'm asking existing. the question is I think this is going to come up over and over again during this, which is we need growth. Um, we all would like to see, I think, consistently we don't fight as, we're not as resistant to commercial growth. So we have these commercial growth goals or demands or projections, and then we're kind of using that to justify the residential growth. And I don't understand this 20,000 number. I mean, our 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 economy is running pretty well if 20,000 people are having to drive in to fill those jobs. Like, so what? And, and we're not using really that 20,000 number in, um, in our plan. We're planning right. for the 31,000, and that's the number we've been operating under. I think, you know, we're, we're, we're taking, you know, a, into consideration that we have, potentially have, a, a, an existing demand of 20,000, but we're not really factoring that into the general plan projections moving forward. So we're, there's we're projecting for we want to hit this jobs target, and to hit the jobs target, we need to create at least this many housing. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. So there's the assumption that to get those 59,000 jobs, the true demand might be 51,000 homes, but we've conceded that you know, 40% of people are going to choose to live out west because they don't want to live in a high-density area. I mean, I'm talking Frederick, Washington, Carroll Counties, or, you know, 
either they can't afford it or they just decide, you know, I want to spend my money. I'd rather move to Westminster and have a place at the beach or whatever. You know what I mean? Um, okay. Correct. That, yes, um, that's, I got you. Just as a supplementary document, we've received a um, presentation from Economic Development Authority about a year ago that really dug into the commuting flows. And right. that's where um, I first got the information that we have an additional 20,000 people net commuting in rather than just out um, each day. And then additionally, when you look at some of our larger employers, they have a real struggle in, um, like the hospital, in filling some of these jobs because people don't want to commute an hour for a low-wage job. Um, and this is also an issue with a variety of sectors. So um, I, would, I would just encourage um, folks to, to reach back out to EDA for that commuting study, which talks a bit about the transportation and where folks are coming from, what those um, considerations are, and then also the RCL Co. study is available on the HOCO by Design site. Um, I think the background to where, where I was going with this 20,000 is we just assume that those 20,000 people would otherwise be living here if we build an affordable house for them. Right, Great. like they and would choose to not, have a lower commute case. and yep. no. accessible housing. Right, that yeah. not all of them would, but that many right. of them would make the choice like we have to live in a community with amenities, resources, right. and access. So I don't think it's necessarily real demand from a standpoint of if those houses existed and were affordable, all of a sudden all 20,000 of those people would choose to be here. Some would choose not to be here because... They don't want to live in apartments. They don't want to live in apartments or they don't want to live in a high-density area or even affordable by Howard County standards. Right. And maybe they can make it work, but hey, I'd rather move to Washington County and get more for my buck and get a bigger house for my money. You know, like those kinds of things. So I just want to caution this. I know it's not in the numbers. I'm happy it's not in the numbers. Um, but every time this 20,000 number comes up, I think we need to be mindful that that, that isn't, if the houses only existed, they'd be here. So. Right. There may be people who would choose longer commutes and things like that. Um, I had a, a, a piece of clarity um, from Ms. Walsh's questions. So we have 2% of undeveloped land, and then earlier you said the, um, the activity centers are 1.5%. And is, I'm presuming that there is not overlap between that 2% and the 1.5, because we're looking at redevelopment versus greenfield land. Is that correct? That is correct. They are not overlapping. Okay. So with the vast majority of growth being concentrated and focused on this 1.5% of the total county in the activity centers, which is separate from the 2% of undeveloped land with these environmental features. Correct. Thank you. All right. Um, do we want to go back to Ms. Young and then Ms. Walsh? And no. Ms. Walsh can go. Yeah. I would okay. love the follow-up to this. And someone in this room knows this, where that 20,000 figure came from. What, we don't know where that came from? No, they said I, RCL Co. I don't remember it being in that EDA. I thought it was a calculation, or at least some component of it, was calculating what, what people were paying for housing and this notion that you should not be paying more than 30% of your income on housing. And so included in that number of people who need homes or houses, units needed, was people who are living here but right. are paying more than 30%. I thought that, like yeah. in the housing opportunities study... But but okay, well, that was the thing we got from housing. Here or something. No, I, but I thought that was five thousand. Me too, and that's that's why I wanted to hear. How five thousand was five the people here that are housing insecure, paying too much of their income. You know that was, I, I think we remember that the same way. Okay, but then, we're saying that that gateway is not even in these numbers. Which like, means it would be no thirty-five thousand. It's so that I, I, I thank you for asking that question. Gateway, so that I mean, would mean 35,000 to total to units then, because now it says future capacity 27 plus 9,000 and gateways nine. I, I, I'm confused about that too. Um, so I'm just requesting that we attempt to avoid crosstalk just because I, I find it very truly functional, challenging okay, to hear. So maybe we can start um, out and I'm with, sure people online with as the, well. the numbers that we're using to plan, we're planning around. We're not planning around the 20,000. The 20,000 is just something, as Mr. Youngman mentioned, is as a consideration that it might be that we have more demand than the 31,000. But we're starting with the bare minimum of 31,000, right? 
So that's the baseline for the commercial uh, residential demand. And then the 59,000 is the demand that we're targeting for jobs. Correct. Do you want to speak to the capacity question? Sure. So um, considering our existing capacity, we have the capacity for about, um, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I believe it was 23,000 homes. Um, so with those activity centers, that's how we get up to the 27,000 homes. Um, so that's trying to reach that overall demand number that Amy mentioned. Um, similarly, with the jobs, we have an existing capacity for 28,000 jobs. And through the flume, we have a uh, future capacity for 35,000 jobs. So again, we're trying to reach those overall demand numbers so that 35. were established by our CLCO in our market assessment. And neither of those include Gateway, correct? Correct. Neither include yeah. Gateway. And Gateway that is so is we can have a very specific discussion around correct. Gateway with and the gate. And we've yeah. said we want a Gateway master plan so we can get very specific with Gateway. Is right. that correct? Correct. That's, exa that's exactly it. We're going to go through that um, this year. Um, so we'll be able to, we're going to try to meet that gap, right, with, with the Gateway Master Plan um, okay. or through that process. So let's go Miss Walsh and then Miss Young and then Mr. Youngman. Actually, yeah, I think I kind of want to do this, but I'm going to. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping. So I, is question? the theory that Gateway is not meeting these needs and demands that we're putting in this slide that we just looked at, that this is some independent microcosm that's meeting and, and creating its own demands? Like, why isn't Gateway meeting the, the demand for X number of housing units or creating X number of well, jobs? Well, currently it's zoned M1, so we can't, you can't do any housing at Gateway right now. So, But this is a, okay. Yeah, so, the, so I, uh, the, the, the premise is that the master plan process will determine how much of the demand Gateway can accommodate. We don't know that yet until we go through that process. We would... Rather than speculating and just <laughs> pick it, you know, when we knew that there was going to be a master plan right around the corner, it made sense to just wait until that process to identify how much demand Gateway can accommodate. So we know that, you know, in this plan, there's, there's a gap between the, um, the activity center growth that we can accommodate, the 1.5% of the county, and then the total demand. And so we're looking at Gateway to try to bridge that to the extent possible. And so that'll it, happen through the master plan. It is subtractive then. The, this 31 or 31 plus 20 or whatever would, some number of units provided at Gateway would meet that demand that we've identified. Would meet that, that, correct. Okay. Would meet the, 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 the total demand of 31,000 homes and 59,000 jobs. Okay, so I think I understand that part. But then the more concerning part is, if I'm reading the, the circles on these maps right, that's the second biggest activity center in the entire future landmass or whatever and we don't have a plan for that yeah. Yeah. so that's why we're that's why we're going to have to embark on a master planning process so we'll be hiring a consultant to go through a master planning process to really develop a more specific plan similar to what we did with downtown columbia but is that like building a house and being like i'm going to put the kitchen in later i, I don't how i mean isn't no, this it's, a central I, component of this whole theory that, you know, we're going to focus stuff here? Are, are, are we leaving blanks? I, I don't know. The, the master plan will help identify what the infrastructure demands, what the infrastructure needs will be given whatever the, whatever the housing projections, whatever the job projections will be for that area. It's really going to get into the specifics and the phasing for how we will actually go about redeveloping Gateway. So it's, it's more like the, the blueprint or the architect the architectural drawings for the house. So we know how many jobs are needed for Gateway and how many jobs will be provided at Gateway, and we know how many people we want to live in Gateway now? There will be, I think, separate um, uh, analyses and research done. So similar to what we've done for HOCO by Design, we've done a market assessment. Uh, we'll be doing the same market, market assessment that focuses on Gateway as a part of the master plan. All right, Ms. Young. 